or actual Bibles. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, foundational scriptures. This is overcoming general, generational curses. This will be number four in the series. Overcoming generational curses, number four. And this will be uh, for a subtitle, Curse Causes. Curse Causes. And everybody said, I feel led to go to lunch. No. <laughs> Curse causes. All right, let's start with Exodus 20, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a what? Yeah. Jealous God. What's he do? He visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto what? Third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Whew. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. We need to learn that. <laughs> the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Hallelujah. Matthew 15, 13. But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. Galatians 3, 13, shouting ground. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Curses everyone that hangs on a tree. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. Well, glory just got you excited there. I need to quit now before you get upset at me. No, you won't do that. All right, let's define it. Generational curse or family curse. It's an uncleansed iniquity that increases in strength from one generation to the next, and it affects the members of that family and all who come into relationship with that family. Amen. And also with this series, we also made available to you a little test you can take for yourself to find out, and they're available uh, as you leave. You can get one out back. But praise God, Jesus came and did what? He redeemed us from the curse, but, but, it has to be received by faith. Faith isn't important. Oh, yes, it is. The God kind of faith is really important. And, number, you know, we looked about the fact that before you can solve a problem, you got to admit there's a problem. That old dog that says, you know, well, that's just the way it is, that thing won't hunt in the light of the Word of God anymore. Amen. Now, because of the fall, curses are in the earth. They're in the earth. They're rampant in the earth. And they're looking for doorways. I knew you'd love me this morning. They're looking for doorways or entrances so they can manifest themselves. But Christ has redeemed us for the curse of the law. Proverbs 26, 2. This is one of those verses, you know, you look at and you think, whoa, I didn't want to see that, but now you're going to get to. Proverbs 26, 2. As the bird by wandering, as the swallows by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, if it's there, there's a reason it showed up. It's one thing to be flying around, but when it starts making a nest in your head, you need to be paying attention. Curses find a cause. They find a doorway. They find an entrance. In other words, something happened to open that door. Family curses, of course, are sins that someone in the family rebelled against God in some manner, way, shape, or form. I know that doesn't fit anybody here. <laughs> so these family curses then, these violations or these rebelliousness, they, 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 they come on down the family tree because of iniquity, which is unrepented sin that's repeated and repeated and repeated and eventually becomes an iniquity. Those curses are released. They gain dominance when someone disobeys the word. God is a God of covenants. Isn't that wonderful? Yes and no, it's wonderful. We, we talk about the fact that we have a covenant with God. But, but, 
every covenant has sanctions to it. It's like, you know, your insurance, <laughs> your homeowner's insurance, whatever, it's got a lot of fine print to it. Without sanctions, there's no covenant. Sanctions, they're, they're, those are penalties or, or other means of important enforcement that they provide incentive to obey the law. These are rules. These are regulations. Well, I, well it's just, you know, God's full of grace. Yes, he is. He's full of grace. He's full of love. He's full of mercy. And he has rules. Amen. The word is full of blessings for obedience. And it's full of penalties when we break those laws. How come I got an amen on the first part, but it got real quiet on the second part? Those penalties that come, those are curses. Curses don't just happen, they come through causes. And we're going to look at some causes of them that come. <laughs> and some of them we've already looked at a little bit, but we need to look at them again. Uh, Cain, he was cursed because he shed innocent blood. Genesis chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> you know, God wasn't seeking information here. Gee. I mean, if God says, What are you doing? Don't you think he knows? <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. Put one over on you, didn't I? Ha <laughs> ha. Verse 10, he said, what hast thou done? The voice, watch this, the voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. Blood is covenant, folks. Verse 11, and now you are cursed from the earth which you have, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Cain murdered his brother Abel because of jealousy. Cain, a lot of people don't understand this. Cain, when he brought the offering to Jehovah God, it was leftovers. It wasn't the best, it was what was left over. And God refused that. Boy, that'll preach. I'm just seeing if I get to it right now. I'm just checking. I'll get to next week. I give you time to stay home, make up an excuse for not coming, right? <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> Some of you missed that little part there. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but Abel brought the first fruits, and his was accepted. By murdering his family, now watch this, by murdering his family, he cursed himself. He left the family of God. And he built the first city-state government. This is what I believe was the birthing of secular humanism. Secular humanism. Statism. Division of kingdoms. The, ideology, ideolo pff, the ide ideological process of statism says that sovereignty is vested not in God, but in the national state. All individuals and associations exist only to enhance the power, the prestige, and the well-being of the state. Thanks, Cain. We as Christians should not look to the state as our source We should not have to look to the state as our protector and or provider. We need to look to Jesus, who is the author and developer of our faith. Number two, another curse, Canaan, who was the grandson of Noah. Think about this. Noah's a good guy. Wasn't perfect as such as we would consider perfection today. There's only one of us. <laughs> Y'all know I'm joshing, but anyway. 
He was cursed for sexual perversion. Genesis chapter 9, verse 20 through 25. Noah began to be an husband, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was... And he was uncovered within his tent. That means naked. He didn't have his blanket on. No, he was naked. Okay. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told of his true brethren without. Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew, not, and knew what his younger son had done to him. He awoke and knew what his son had done to him. His son did not just look at him. Otherwise, he wouldn't have known that. Verse 25, and he said, Cursed be Canaan. Sure getting quiet in this Presbyterian church this morning. <laughs> Now watch what he says. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Noah spoke a curse over his grandson Canaan. Watch this. That's my grandson. Don't make no difference. Well, oh, this is good meddling time. You know that? I'm just having too much fun. But I'm protected by this invisible shield. See? Now it should be clear to us if you do any Bible study, the iniquity of Ham was transferred down the family tree and affected his family lineage. In the key word study Bible, a fellow by the name of Spirosodiates, this is a quote from him. The fact that Noah's curse was directed against Canaan indicates that Canaan was somehow involved in immoral and indecent behavior with his drunken grandfather. Ham was indirectly to blame because he had allowed Canaan to grow up with his character and because he evidently did not treat Noah with respect when he found him. Noah was the family patriarch, okay? And his words carried high-level spiritual authority. According to Zodiades, Canaan was cursed because of sexual perversion that was working within his family. Watch how this goes down the tree. Noah's prophecy was fulfilled when the Canaanites became hearers of word and drawers of water for the Israelites. They became servants. The words from Noah were not out of hatred or malice, but spoken out of his spirit. Scripture is clear. The wages of sin is death. And this curse was the result of Ham's sin released down the family tree, manifesting itself in Canaan's action, which in turn was going into the family, which resulted in Sodom and Gomorrah, and go on from there. It's bad stuff, folks. Number three, something else that opens some doors. <laughs> Praise God. You know I love y'all. I'll maybe skip over this one because here we go. Number three, bringing ad <laughs> Abominations, morally disgusting objects or idols into your house. When I was in Vietnam, BC, okay, remember that, BC, we'd, we'd sometimes go to a, a bar, really, BC, <laughs> and because sometimes they would throw bombs in the bars, you would always go to the back of the bar. Got it? But before you do that, what you do is, most of the bars we went into, they had a Buddha sitting at the front door. And what you do is, you give him a cigarette and rub his belly. <laughs> B.C. <sighs> had nothing to do with giving him a cigarette and rub his belly. Someone, someone back home was praying for my stupid stealth. But anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 through 26. This is in the Bible, by the way. Okay, just want to let you know. 
The graven image is of their God shall you burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Some of these items could include such things as demonic objects, jewelry, paintings, artwork, music, games, videos, occult items in general. You see, some of these, a few years ago, we, uh, we found some things uh, in their music that uh, I decided wasn't bringing glory to God. We had a record burning session at our house. And that's exactly what we did. Made the kids matter in a wet hand. <laughs> really? Yeah, I did that more than once. But I'll tell you what, it wasn't in my house. Come on now. Well, you don't understand. Okay. Friendliness, curse. Right. Number four, rebuilding what God has destroyed. How would we do that? Joshua 6, 26. Joshua drew them at the time saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and buildeth the city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. Huh. A whole bunch of people have received forgiveness and freedom from, from darkness. Cursed is the one who rebuilds or reintroduces into the lives of others anything the Holy Spirit wants destroyed. You got that? Somebody was an alcoholic, they got delivered, and you offer them a drink. Come on in. Come on, folks. Amen. For example, uh, you have some ungodly soul ties and, and, and family curses that were broken by the power of the Spirit and, and witchcraft or spiritualism and to introduce that stuff back to them brings a curse. Yeah. Got it? Yeah. I didn't write this, by the way. <laughs> Another thing, God didn't ask my permission. In fact, didn't we read in the beginning? He is God. <laughs> Number five. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Second Kings chapter 9, verse 30 and 34. This is operating in a Jezebel spirit, probably the most prevalent spirit alive and well on the planet today, especially in churches. 2 Kings 9, 30-34, when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezreel heard, Jezebel heard of it, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face, tired her hair, and looked out at a window. And as Jehu entered at the gate, she said, had Zimri peace, who slew his master? And he slipped, did you see how I did that? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who's on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. Hoo -hoo. And he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall, on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. And when he was come, he did eat and drink and said, Go, see now this cursed woman, bury her, for she's a king's daughter. One thing the people, remember uh, Elisha, Elisha won a double portion? You know why? A lot of people say so we could do twice as much. No, Jezebel. He had to deal with Jezebel. Jezebel was the one that ran Elijah off. Yep. Remember that? Elijah meets with, think about it for a minute, Elijah. All these high priests of Baal and, and all this stuff, you know, and he just calls fire down on them and says, you know, your God isn't worth anything. Take your best shot. And Elijah calls fire down on him. And Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. And Elijah says, woo, and leaves town. So Elisha wanted a double portion. Why? So he could get this thing. 
okay? And he did. Thousands have been chained by her, the spirit. It's controlling, manipulating, it's seducing, it's power hungry, it's a politician. Oh, excuse me, I didn't say that. A Freudian slip, maybe. It's a, it's, it's a spirit that makes spiritual eunuchs out of her followers. And what that means is they don't make their own decisions unless they check with her first. I'm not going to deal with Je I may do a whole series on Jezebel because there's amazing in-depth stuff about Jezebel, maybe in the near future. So number six, now I know this is nobody here, but maybe you know somebody. Number six, the arrogant and the proud. <laughs> Psalms, <laughs> Psalms 119, verse 21. <laughs> Thou, come on, clock, hurry me up here. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are which do err from thy commandments. I have news for you. Not everyone that starts out with Jesus ends the race with him. Some folks get a little bit in the error, they get lost. And there's a whole bunch of arrogant secular humanists in the world that refuse to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus so they even exist as, a, as who he was. Some of these were once leaders of Christian churches. Others were like, I know personally of a, an individual who was on fire for God, just absolutely tearing up devils, everything, you know, and, and uh, a huge ministry. And man, he just turned backwards. Oh, my Lord, I don't know where, what's going on with him now, but he has gotten so weird. Big church. In fact, Tulsa, Oklahoma is where he was. The arrogant and proud, what do they do? Well, they think themselves more highly than they should. You should think of yourselves highly as God has called you, but not more highly than you should think of yourself. In myself, I'm zero. With him, I'm everything. They, they feel themselves greater than, than anybody else. So they're uppity and puffed up. And, oh, I don't have time to talk about that right now. Sir Thomas More I believe coined the term utopian society. That was in 1516. His book Utopia was based largely on Plato's Republic. And in his essay, Moore describes there was this fictional island community in the Atlantic Ocean. And, and this was utopia. It was a perfect version of society where all such evils as, as, as poverty, uh, misery, social injustice, those were all banished. That's a fairy tale, folks. Jesus said, for instance, you're always going to have to pour with you. Yeah. Scripture is very clear. James 1.17 says, every good and every perfect gift is from above. Comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, no shadow of turning. There can be no utopian society built by man without Jesus. Amen. 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 There was this brother from India who wrote this, this uh, minister, and this is what he wrote. He wrote that deliverance from all curses is available. Listen to what he said. Many of God's people tolerate curses instead of exposing them. Can't we just get along? No. You're not called to get along, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. You're called to rule and reign. Well, that'll upset the bunch, won't it? <laughs> Religion doesn't like that, especially Jezzy. Yep. She's a real belle of the ball, you know. <laughs> Jezza, bell. Of the Bereans were a, a religious group that searched the scriptures daily for, so they could get some understanding and some truth to how to protect themselves from deception. People reproduce after their own kind. The unrepentant reproduce after the first Adam, 
which results in spiritual death, deception, and independence from God. Others reproduce after the second Adam, which is abundant life, hallelujah, and good works through dependence on Jesus and a ministry of the Holy Ghost. Deliverance from all curses and their consequences is available through Christ's work on Calvary through true repentance and renouncement of sin. True repentance and renouncement of sin. I'm going to really cover that hopefully next week in Rhema about what true repentance is. Now, we just looked at those six curses that hit the targets, and they're all there because of sin and passed down from generation. They can be broken through godly sorrow, repentance, and applying the blood of Jesus to your heart. Uh, of course, there's lots of other curses, and next week we're going to be looking at some more. But I do have some good news. If you don't think I've had some good news this morning, I've got some good news. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made cursed for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come on us through faith. Praise God. So no matter what it is that's in your family tree, you can cut that puppy down and dig it up by the roots because what God has not planted, he shall dig up and get rid of it in Jesus' name. Amen? But it's not going to happen just because you want it to happen. It's going to happen because of the Word of God and your faith in it. This whole thing is, number one, to recognize the curses that might be in your family. And number two, if the Lord tarries, to stop them from going any further or creating more curses down the line. Amen. That's the whole purpose of this thing. Amen. Amen. I mean, I'd much rather have uh, blessings to a thousand generations if the Lord tarries than curses to three or four. Amen. Amen. So it's up to you. Isn't that good news? <laughs> the first thing we need to do, recognize there's a problem, then fix it. But you've got to recognize the problem. As long as you don't recognize there's a problem, you can't do anything about it. And it'll just grow and grow and continue to grow stronger and stronger, be passed on down, and that's the way it goes. Parenting, my Lord Jesus. What are we passing on to some of our kids and our grandkids with our slothfulness and our laziness and our relationship with God and our compromising the Word of God all the time? What are we passing down to our kids and our grandkids? Several years ago, it was a, a, a real blessing to me. Uh, I visited uh, our kids in, in Phoenix, and uh, they were taking them to school, and I rode along. And... Uh, I just sitting there, didn't say a word. And every week, well, every day when we took our kids to school when they were growing up, we would all say uh, 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 scriptures and, and uh, you know, how the God's going to bless us and everything else. No play come there, do the Lord's going to you know, charge me and keep going. And I'll be doggone if those kids didn't say it all, all by themselves automatically as they're going to school. Same thing we used to tell mama, their mama, which is my daughter. Same thing we used to tell her when they're going to school. And she passed it down to them. And bless God, I believe they're going to be passed down to the grandbabies. And on down, those were my grandbabies at the time. But I mean, on to the great grandbabies and all that. But see, you can pass that stuff down to kids. Amen. And that's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. You got to just tough it up. Love them with the God kind of love, not that gushy wooshy stuff. Amen. That gushy wooshy stuff won't get it in when, when tough times come, folks. Mm -mm. No. And, and, and as a young person, you know, teach your, teach, your, teach your daughters. I used to tell my kids, I said, you, my girls, I said, you can go on dates when I can go with you. I said, well, you can go on a date, but someone's going with you. Why is it that they have to go on a date? Oh, here's one for you. Watch how our culture's changed. Why is it that they have to go on a date alone? Come on. See? 
But they sure want to, don't they? Why? Oh, because I want to be friendly with them. Yeah, you're friendly and you're stupid. Well, they won't do anything. Oh, they don't have hormones. I understand. And that, and that, that, that sort of muscle-bound, blue-eyed guy won't say things like, oh, I love you. You know, he, no, that'll never work. This ain't a family series, but I'd be it's almost time to get into it this morning about that stuff. Because, you know, my kids are all going to heaven. But I can tell you when they were at home, that journey was tough for them. <laughs> Absolutely. But it produced some good results in them. I said, there it produced some good results in them. Praise the Lord. How many, how many of you guys have, have had your, your kids say, Dad, tell me I can't go somewhere? Because they didn't want to get embarrassed by telling the kids that they didn't want to go. So if Dad said they can't go, then they have an excuse and they can save their face. Yeah. I'll never forget the time Tabby came up to me and says, Dad, I want to run, run away from home. I says, okay, why are you telling me? Well, I just want to run away from home, but I wanted to let you know. I said, all right, where are you going to go? I don't know. I just want to try it. I said, all right. Uh, how are you going to do it? I don't know. I said, well, you can open your window and jump out there. <laughs> so she opened the window and jumped outside and came around the front door. Hi. <laughs> hey, Ben. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it was uh, rather interesting in my house sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, God's good, folks. And all of us, nobody here has, has you know, we, we, we've all come from dysfunctional families and we raised a bunch of dysfunctional stuff. But by, by the word of Almighty God through his Holy Spirit, we can fix some things. We can't necessarily go back and fix the messes up we did before, but we can stop stuff from going any further than now. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, let's just all stand on our feet and let's pray and thank God for his word. Father, we bless you. We thank you so much.